Chapter 23 of The History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume 1, by Eliza Haywood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joyce Martin. Chapter 23. Among other things necessary to be told, gives an account of the success of a plot laid by Mr. Chatfrey for the discovery of Miss Betsy's real sentiments. Although Mr. Goodman had as yet no intimations of the accidents of that morning, yet was he extremely uneasy. The looks, as well as words of Mr. Staple, in going out of his house the day before, were continually in his mind, and he could not forbear apprehending some fatal consequence would, one time or another, attend to the levity of Miss Betsy's behavior and conduct in regard to her admirers. He was also both surprised and vexed that Mr. Bluemaker, from whom he expected an explanation of the Westminster Abbey adventure, had not come according to his request. This last motive of his disquiet was, however, soon removed. Mr. Bluemaker was no less impatient to clear himself of all blame concerning the transactions of that night, had no sooner finished his affair with the Lord, and was dismissed by the High Bailiff. Then he came directly to Mr. Goodman's, and recited to him and all the ladies the whole of what had passed. Miss Betsy laughed prodigiously, but Mr. Goodman shook his head on hearing the particulars related by Mr. Bluemaker, and, after that gentleman was gone, reproved, as he thought it his duty to do, the inconsiderateness of her conduct. He told her that, as she was alone, she ought to have left the Abbey as soon as divine service was ended, and that for a person of her sex, age, and appearance, to walk in a place where there were always a great concourse of young sparks, who came for no other purpose than to make remarks upon the ladies, could not but be looked on as very odd by all who saw her. There was no rain, said he, till a long time after the service was ended, and you might then in all probability have got a chair, or if not, the walk over the park could not have been a very great fatigue. Miss Betsy blushed extremely, not through a conscious shame of imagining what she had done deserved the least rebuke, but because her spirit, yet unbroke, could not bear control. She replied that she meant no ill, those who censured her were most in fault. "'That is very true,' answered Mr. Goodman, "'but, my dear child, you cannot but know it is a fault which too many in the world are guilty of. I doubt not of your innocence, but would have you consider that reputation is also of some value, that the honor of a young maid like you is a flower of so tender and delicate a nature that the least breath of scandal withers and destroys it. In fine, that it is not enough to be good without behaving in such a manner as to make others acknowledge us to be so. Miss Betsy had too much understanding not to be sensible what her guardian said on this occasion was perfectly just, and also that he had a right to offer his advice, whenever her conduct rendered it necessary, but could not help being vexed that anything she did should be liable to censure, as she thought it merited none. She made no further reply, however, to what Mr. Goodman said, though he continued his remonstrances and probably would have gone on much longer if not interrupted by the coming in of Mr. Chatfrey. This gentleman, having parted from the two wounded rivals, came directly to Mr. Goodman's in order to see how Miss Betsy would receive the intelligence he had to bring her. After paying his compliments to Mr. Goodman and the other ladies, he came toward Miss Betsy, and looking on her with a more than ordinary earnestness in his countenance, "'Ah, madam,' said he, "'I shall never hereafter see you without remembering what Callie says of a lady who might, I suppose, be like you. So fatal, and withal so fair, we're told destroying angels are.' Though Miss Betsy was not at that time in a humour to have any great relish for raillery, yet she could not forbear replying to what this old gentleman said in the manner in which she imagined he spoke. "'You are at least past the age of being destroyed by any weapons I carry about me,' cried she. "'But pray, what meaning have you in this terrible simile?' "'My meaning is as terrible as the simile,' answered he. 
and though I believe you to be very much the favorite of heaven, I know not how you will atone for the mischief you have been the occasion of this morning. But it may be, continued he, that you think it nothing that those murdering eyes of yours have set two gentlemen a-fighting. Miss Betsy, supposing no other than that he had heard of the quarrel between Mr. Bluemaker and the Lord, replied merrily, Pray, accuse my eyes of no such thing. They are very innocent, I assure you. Yes, cried Mr. Goodman and Lady Mellison at the same time. We can clear Miss Betsy of this accusation. What? rejoined Mr. Chatfrey hastily. Was not Mr. Staple and Mr. Trueworth rivals for her love? Mr. Staple and Mr. Trueworth, said Miss Betsy, in a good deal of consternation. Pray, what of them? Oh, the most inveterate duel, answered he. They fought above half an hour, and poor Mr. Staple is dead of his wounds. Dead! cried Miss Betsy, with a great scream. Lady Mellison and Miss Flora seemed very much alarmed, but Mr. Goodman was ready to sink from his chair, till Mr. Chatfrey, unseen by Miss Betsy, winked upon him, in token that he was not in earnest in what he said. The distraction in which this young lady now appeared, the concern she expressed for Mr. Staple, and her indignation against Mr. Trueworth, would have made any one think the former had much the preference in her esteem, till Mr. Chatfrey, after having listened to her exclamations on the score, cried out in a sudden, "'Ah, madam, what a mistake has the confusion I was involved in made me guilty of! Alas, I have deceived you, though without designing to do so. Mr. Staple lives. It is Mr. Trueworth who has fallen a sacrifice to his unsuccessful passion for you.' Trueworth dead, cried Miss Betsy. Oh, God! And does his murderer live to triumph in the fall of the best, most accomplished men on earth? Oh, may all the miseries that heaven and earth can inflict light on him! Is he not secured, Mr. Chatfrey? Will he not be hanged? Mr. Chatfrey could hold his countenance no longer, but bursting into a violent fit of laughter, Ah, oh, Miss Betsy, Miss Betsy, said he, I have caught you. Mr. Trueworth, I find, then, is the happy man. "'What do you mean, Mr. Chatfrey?' cried Miss Betsy, very much amazed. "'I beg your pardon,' answered he, "'for the fright I have put you in, but be comforted, "'for Mr. Trueworth is not dead, I assure you, "'and, I doubt not, lives as much your slave as ever.' "'I do not care what he is if he is not dead,' said Miss Betsy. "'But pray for what end did you invent this fine story?' "'Nay, madam,' resumed he, "'it is not altogether my own inventing, neither, "'for Mr. Trueworth and Mr. Staple have had a duel this morning, "'and both of them are wounded, "'though not so dangerously as I pretended, "'merely to try by the concern you would express "'which of them you were most inclined to favour. "'And I have done it, I faith. "'Mr. Trueworth is the man.' "'Lady Mellison, who had not spoke during all this conversation, "'now cried out, "'Aye, Mr. Chatfrey, we shall soon have a wedding, I believe.' "'Believe, madam,' said he, "'why your ladyship may swear it. "'For my part, I will not give above a fortnight for the conclusion, "'and I will venture, too, with a fair bride, joy on the occasion, "'for he is a fine gentleman, a very fine gentleman indeed, "'and I think she could not have made a better choice.' "'With these words he wiped his mouth "'and advanced to Miss Betsy in order to salute her but pushing him scornfully back. "'None of your flights, good Mr. Chapfrey,' said she. "'If I thought you were in earnest, I would never see the face of Mr. Trueworth more.' This did not hinder the pleasant old gentleman from continuing his raillery. He plainly told Miss Betsy that she was in love, and that he saw the marks of it upon her, and that it was in vain for her to deny it. Lady Mellison laughed very heartily to see the fret Miss Betsy was in at hearing Mr. Chatfrey talk in this manner. But Miss Flora, to whom one would imagine this scene would have been diverting enough, never opened her lips to utter one syllable, but made such grimaces as, had they been taken notice of, would have shown how little she was pleased with it. Mr. Goodman had been so much struck with the first account given by Mr. Chatfrey that he was not to be roused by anything that gentleman said afterwards. He reflected that though the consequences of the recounter between the two rivals had been less fatal than he had been made to imagine, yet it might have happened, and indeed been naturally expected. 
He could not forbear, therefore, interrupting his friend's mirth by remonstrating to Miss Betsy in the most serious terms the great error she was guilty of in encouraging a plurality of lovers at the same time. He told her that gentlemen of Mr. Trueworth's and Mr. Staple's character and fortune ought not to be trifled with. Suppose, said he, that one or both of them had indeed been killed. How could you have answered to yourself or to the world the having been the sad occasion? Lord, sir, replied Miss Betsy, walking up and down the room in a good deal of agitation, what would you have me do? I do not want the men to love me, and if they will play the fool and fight and kill one another, it is none of my fault. In fine, between Mr. Chatfrey's raillery and Mr. Goodman's admonitions, this poor young lady was teased beyond all patience, and finding it impossible to put a stop to either, she flew out of the room ready to cry with vexation. She was no sooner gone than Mr. Goodman took Mr. Chatfrey into his closet, and having learned from him all the particulars of the late duel, and consulted with him what was proper to be done to prevent any further mischief of the like sort, they went together to Mr. Staple's lodging, in order to use their utmost endeavours to prevail on that gentleman to desist the prosecution of his addresses to Miss Betsy. End of the first volume End of chapter 23 Reading by Joyce Martin End of The History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume 1, by Eliza Haywood.